Welcome back to The Urban Monk. I'm happy to be back in studio. Finally done filming the Prosperity movie, I promise. Uh, it is done, it is locked, it's off to edit. Um, I can't tell you what happened at the end of this thing. Uh, I was just um, in Panama finishing it out and it was a really interesting end to the movie and you're gonna have to wait till it comes out. Uh, um, but you know, needless to say, it had a lot to do with oceans and uh, some of the things that kind of came up in the arc of our development of the story uh, that weren't in the movie originally had to do with, you know, kind of noticing some of the, the crap floating around in the oceans uh, where we were filming some of this stuff. And so it really got me sparked on the subject and I started looking into it and um, man, uh, we got some work to do. Uh, there is a lot of plastic in our oceans and what we see on the surface is maybe 50% of what's in there, the rest of it's sinking to the bottom. And so it's creating a very big problem. And so we uh, called in an airstrike here. Um, you know how I love uh, having uh, you know the smartest people on the show. I have Elizabeth Murdoch from the Natu Na Natural Resources Defense Council. These guys have been you know on the front line on a lot of these issues uh, and uh, they have a very big ocean initiative and so who better to talk to about this topic. Hi and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Pedram. It's really an honor to be here and I'm really, really pleased to get a chance to talk with you and your audience. So first of all, thanks for doing the work that you do. I mean, this is, you know, it's it's oftentimes a thankless job doing this stuff and, and it's oftentimes man, it's just so big. It's so it's really hard to compete with, you know, China dumping stuff in the ocean all the time. And so it's like, sometimes we feel like we're scratching the surface, but it's still, you know, I kind of think of the old Gandalf quote, you know, it might be a fool's hope, but we still gotta, you know, go after right. it kind of thing, right? And <laughs> definitely. so let, let's just uh, let's just let uh, uh, my audience know what the NRDC is, mission and all that, so we can kind of set the table and then go in and, and, and talk about the rest of the stuff. Sure, I'd be happy to talk about mm -hmm. that. So the Natural Resources Defense Council Council. is one of the most effective uh, environmental organizations in in the U.S. and we have been um, our our uh, president likes to say we've been suing polluters since 1970. Um, we have been on the front lines of protecting our air, water, communities, wildlife since the 1970s, and we do that through law, policy, advocacy, and science. So it's a really exciting place to work, um, and I, I feel really honored to be part of that effort to protect our planet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, someone's got to do it, right? And, and so, you know, here's one of the things that I, I kind of feel happens a lot, um, especially in like my circle of friends, is like, you know, there, there's people that out there that do this. So you're like, oh, you know, we have, you know, we have, you know, our, our troops that go and fight for us. But uh, you know, you guys, you know, a you need funding. B you need, you know, clicks and votes and and signatures and all right. the things that help you kind of make it happen. And so, you, you know, you're actually on the front line. Like if I'm pissed off about something oceanic, chances are you're gonna be able to you know, help us get that solved You know, because uh, you've been running those miles and you've been you know, at, really at the front lines of this stuff. Yeah, that's what we try to do certainly. And I think you know, there's, uh, obviously it, it is an effort of, of thousands of people. You know, And so I think NRDC works really deeply on a bunch of different issues. And then we also network with other really excellent organizations and try to partner with them. Um, and then, as you mentioned, too, engaging communities. I think increasingly this is really an important element. Uh, and, and the truth is, I just said increasingly, but it has always been an important element mm -hmm. of environmental protection that the communities that are affected step forward and talk about what those impacts are, whether it's the impacts of overfishing um, on, on fishermen who've relied on that resource for their livelihood, or whether it's the blight of plastic bags and plastic bottles in your neighborhood, um, or whether it's you know pollution coming from a, a dirty um, energy plant in your neighborhood. So anyways, that's yeah. really a, a complex network. So, and, and it's a complex problem set too, which is really, you know, the, the challenge here. It's so, you know, when I'm in, uh, you know, off, off on these adventures in Panama and I like, came home with an ear infection. So something, something about that water. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, we did do a victory swim. Uh, so we'll you get know, right I, on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's, there's hard plastic, then there's the soft plastic, like the, the plastic bags, then there's tin and all sorts of other things, styrofoam. So, you know, so there's all kinds of gunk in the water and there's certain, right. certain types of plastic you could take and recycle but it's really expensive to do so. And then there's the plastic we don't see. So, you know, the, the, the microbeads and like, you know, just the, the, the polyester shirt that goes through the washing right. machine and all that. So I'd love to kind of see the lay of the land because I think a lot of people think of like plastic bags 
And, and I want to talk about, you know, the, you know, thank God, you know, we've, you guys have done a lot of work on that and, and gotten those kind of out of certain counties. And now it looks like all California. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes. We just had a huge push this last um, election, actually, in November um, to ma to maintain our plastic bag ban. And I'd be happy to talk more about that. But we actually got it on the ballot, statewide ban on plastic bags. And then the bag manufacturers pushed to get a referendum on the ballot to undo that law. And Californians stood strong and, and kept our law in place because people, I think, are really, really concerned about this issue. And it's a big one. I did a story uh, with a big recycling company up in the Bay Area, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and you know they have these you know huge like seventy million dollar, hundred million dollar facilities that are sorting you know tr trash and pulling out recyclables and all this kind of stuff. And and I look over the, at this one pile. I'm like, what about plastic bags? He's like. Nothing. We got nothing, right? Like it's just we can't do anything. And so, you know, I just assume I have a plastic bag. I'm gonna throw it in the recycling bin, and some, somehow it's magically yeah. gonna like you know clear my karma. It just doesn't work that way. Right. Right. Yeah. And I should say, I mean, there's there's a whole science to a lot of this sort of waste recycling and reuse, and um, and um, some a lot of it goes beyond my expertise. But I can say that there are certain grades of plastic that are. Um, very valuable and easy to recycle, and there are others that are not. Mm -hmm. And so that tends to drive what ends up getting recycled. So like, you know, say your bottles that hold Coca-Cola or soda or that sort of thing, those are, are made of a, of, a, of a material that's easier to recycle than, say, plastic bags. And of course, the other problem with plastic bags, and this is true of foam too, is that they're, they get airborne pretty easily. So even if you put them in the trash can, they can blow mm -hmm. out, and then they can easily make their way into the waterway, and then easily make their way from you know, uh, fresh water into oceans where they either entangle or can suffocate um, uh, or be ingested by creatures that we care about, like sea turtles and sea otters and, and even all those little guys that we care about. Or they can break down into tiny little pieces of plastic that just never go away and still um, damage the marine environment. I think there's a lot of people that at this point may have seen the, the you know, the Great Pacific gyre of, of, of plastic you know yeah I, I hear mixed mixed kind of uh, stats on this they say it's the size of Texas now I've heard I've heard people say it's the st size of continental US I, I don't really know but it's just a lot of plastic um, right so what is it you know and there's and there's I think seven of them like what like what's the state of the oceans with all this stuff like how how much are we dealing with and you know when we start talking these statistics it's almost hard to like fathom Right. Yeah, well, there are a couple different ways to answer that. And, and I, I guess one thing I would say, too, is that there's still a lot that we don't know, of course, about this issue, exactly how all the plastic gets into the ocean, all the sources and all the impacts it has. Um, some estimates are that there's 8 million tons of trash a year of, of plastic, pardon me, of plastic waste that ends up in the oceans every year. The, about 80 percent of that, we think, comes from land based sources. There's other plastic that gets in off of ships. You know, it could be um, a derelict fishing gear, you know, fishing gear that's been broken or cut loose. Or um, I actually understand it can also be from shipping containers. Sometimes when there are high seas, uh, the the nets that the shipping, the, those big container ships used to strap down the, the cargo can actually wash off or the cargo itself can wash off. Um, like Moby Duck, you know, the, the mm -hmm. rubber ducks that floated all around the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are lots of ways it gets there. Then I'm glad you mentioned the gyre. Um, those are interesting. I think there are five of them, and um, if I'm not, I think that's right, uh, five or seven. <laughs> and and um, they, these are areas where that plastic amasses. They are massive areas, and um, as you mentioned earlier, it's not just big chunks of plastic floating around. It does break down over time into smaller pieces, and distressingly, it distributes through the water column. So it's not just like I, I, we often get asked that question. Can't you just go out there with a big boom and scrape it all in, you know, and pick it up? How about a vacuum? But the problem is it distributes through the water column, you know, hundreds, thousands of feet down. And so there's not a way to just go scrape it out. Um, it, once it's there, it breaks down and it gets integrated into the ocean. And, and it's really incredibly difficult to extract. These microparticles, if you start looking um, at some of the blood work and the kind of cellular um, chemistry in, in, in human beings, we have a certain percentage of us now that's plastic, 
right? It's just, it gets ingested. And so we, we are consuming plastic in one way or another. Um, you know, I mean, look, chewing gum, it's food grade plastic. I mean, there's, there's plastic everywhere. And so what uh, I saw a story uh, a, a few months ago that just blew my mind is in one of these, uh, I think it's the Pacific Gyre, there's a, there's a species of crab that now has adapted to be able to eat plastic. And so mm -hmm. it now metabolizes the plastic and it's like, you know, made of plastic because that's what it eats. And so we've actually like birthed a new plastic species. And so I'm just waiting for like some smarter like squid or something to start eating that, that, that crab. And all of a sudden we're going to have like, you know, uh, uh, just these whole new plastic inspired species growing biologically as hybrids out of our oceans, which is kind of mm -hmm. creepy. Yeah, it's really distressing. And I think the other thing, too, is there, I mean, there are questions around what the impact of the plastic itself is on marine organisms and then on human beings who eat those marine organisms. So that's mm. that's one interesting area of science people are looking at. And it was actually a study that came out about maybe a year and a half ago that showed, I think it was about a quarter of the fish um, that were caught um, off the coast of California had some form of plastic. You mentioned fibers, like from your, your fleece jacket, for example. Um, in their gut. Now the question that scientists are scratching their head about is if you don't eat the gut of the fish is it is that toxin transferring to the flesh are you are you actually consuming it if it's in the gut um, but you know even if you're not actually getting that plastic we also know that plastics tend to attract or kind of aggregate other pollutants that are in the ocean so like PCBs DDT, all that bad stuff that you don't want in your body actually tends to cling to those plastics. And so that as the plastics get ingested and move up the food chain, those other toxins are also um, concentrating in the flesh of these marine animals that we eat. So a lot's not understood, but we, there's certainly plenty of room for concern. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, out of sight, out of mind, but I mean, if you're eating fish, and, you know, everyone's like, oh, okay, you know, I don't want farmed salmon. I need wild caught salmon because, right. you know, somehow the, the ocean is magically like pure and clean. Uh, you know, most people don't get the kind of the gory view of the detail of what's actually in the water, even when the salmon right. is, you know, so you got to go to farther and farther places. But I mean, if you're eating fish, at some point you're eating plastic, you're eating some, some exposure to these chemicals that, that have been there. And that's, that's a big deal. Um, and we don't even know how big of a deal it is because we haven't really understood the fallout yet, right? I think I think that's correct. And uh, you know, sort of in, a, in an organization surrounded by scientists, I think that um, you know we we say, well, we don't fully understand. We don't right. fully understand what those impacts are. But what we do know is that at some level, those toxins are definitely you know transferring to our bodies. But the other thing about plastic too, beyond that kind of human impact, is that these 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 plastics in the oceans are having a really significant impact on marine species so everything from um and, and i think i mentioned too that the two kind of biggest threats are entanglement um where where species actually get stuck in it could be an old net or a piece of fishing line or it could be i, I saw a horrifying picture during the california bag ban uh effort of a mother's uh, sea otter that had a baby sea otter that had swum into a plastic bag and it was over the sea otter's head that, mm. and the mother was trying to get it off. You know, so horrifying impacts of entanglement. Also ingestion. So sea turtles um, and uh, seabirds tend to eat these things. And so they either die because they choke, like, you know, a sea turtle might mistake a plastic bag for a jellyfish. Looks very similar. And mm. it eats it and it literally, you know, suffocates. Or in the case of like the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, where 80 or 90% of albatross chicks have plastic in their gut. And this is because their parents have gone out to forage and they've come, maybe they've found these chicks that have cigarette lighters in their stomachs and they have starved um, because they feel full, but what they're eating is not food, it's, mm. it's plastic. So, mm. you know, it's, it's really just horrifying impacts. Wow. That, that's okay. So and that's the stuff that we can see and the microparticle stuff. I mean, who right. even knows? I mean, yes, I know right. that there's some kind of fancy things that you could add to your washing machine um, that help kind of pull the microparticle, um, you know, plastics out. But, you know, that's an expense. And, you know, who wants to be inconvenienced right. for the sake of the future? I mean, come on. Right. And, and, and so, you know, that doesn't really happen. And so we don't even know what these microplastics are, are doing and to, to what degree it's even in the water. 
Uh, right, I think that is true. And and so actually one of the things um, a lot of the environmental groups worked on a year ago was trying to get um, – well, actually, we've done it at the state level and the federal level. We've attempted to get bans on some of these microplastic products. And and again, you know, once again, I say, oh, we don't understand everything. We don't even know all the products that contain these microplastics or, or products that can break down into microplastics. But we do know some toothpastes and soaps and uh, those kinds of uh, materials, uh, some of the makeups have little bits of plastic in them for various purposes. And so we got a ban on that use of those microbeads in California. Uh, for that reason. And then a federal ban was passed that restrict that uh, banned use of those uh, microbeads in some restricted amount of products, uh, kind of personal hygiene products. Um, and so that's very important. How we tackle this issue of microfibers and getting them, you know, out of the waterways is um, really tricky because, and, and we've, and environmentalists have been looking at, you know, are there, um, are there bands we can have? Are there ways to ask the uh, manufacturers of certain products to be responsible? Like, you know, are there filters we can put on washers to kind of get this stuff out of, so it doesn't get into the, the, um, the sewer system? Um, so it's very, very tricky. Um, and still lots to be learned, not just about the impacts to us and what we're not seeing, but also about what products we're even using that's putting this into the oceans yeah. in the first place. So we don't even know the products yet because what, is there like not a labeling requirement or is, it, is there a particular type of uh, ingredient? I've, I've, I believe that is correct, that they are not, not all these products are required to disclose what's going in um, mm. into their um, their products. And so, you know, some of these things we know and some of them we don't know, like, um, say, nail polish. Does that have plastic in it or not? We, we're not sure. So that's interesting. So, I mean, and a lot of this needs to happen at the manufacturer level. I mean, if you're if you're downstream trying to clean plastic out of water, that seems like a huge effort. I mean, it makes much more sense to not put it into the, the, the fabric, but I mean, look, polyester, I mean, you know, from, from cotton to polyester is a huge revolution. Now, I mean, right. most environmentalists I know talk about, you know, saying, hey, wear merino wool, wear cotton, wear natural right. fabrics, because right. at least we know that they're not going to, you know, kick right. off crap. I think like a lot of these environmental problems, this is another one that requires kind of a suite of solutions. And so, yes, uh, one effort is to try to um, encourage manufacturers to think about what these impacts are going to be and to think about how to uh, collect whatever that waste material might be at the back end. Um, a lot of it is also about um, pushing one of the major drivers is let's get away from single use plastics. Now I realize that's not necessarily these um, micro fibers we're talking yeah. about, but let's think about reusability and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so it's, and it's also design and that's kind of what you're getting at with let's wear merino wool instead. Mm -hmm. What are the actual uh, materials that are being used and how's the product design? And I think all of those things come into the solution, honestly. Yeah. Um, and I think it calls for a look at too at our consumer habits. You know, what is it that we're buying? You know, um, uh, you know, because you know there have been studies, for example, that point to some of the Asian countries as being the places from which a lot of these plastics flow into the ocean. But we also know that a lot of those countries are producing things that are demanded by U.S. consumers and European consumers, and you know, so it is really a global problem. Yeah. Sonny is um, so my the director of the movie that we're making. Uh, you know, he's, he was leaving. My parents went and got him this shirt. They, you know, they're like, oh, he's eco. So they went and got him a shirt from Costco that was famously, you know, like the, all their whole branding was like, this shirt was made from five plastic bottles of water, right? right? I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's a good reuse of plastic bottles of water. <laughs> right. But but you know, is that now going to re-release slowly through the washing machine back into the water? Right, and, yeah. I, and so, and it's one of those like weird, kind of complex. Am I doing the right thing? Kind of questions, right. right? I've thought of that very problem around this microfiber issue, and I'm not really sure what the answer is. I mean, I think the best best knowledge is yes, these these fibers tend to slough back off, and they end up in the you know the sewer system, and they're too fine to get filtered out by our you know our um, our water. Uh, system. So totally. yeah, I think it is definitely a concern. Um, but, uh, but you know, I think it, certainly it's a good thing that they recycle those bottles too. So, totally. So right. Really right. Is this good or bad? I can't tell. Right. It's so complicated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for, for me, I, you know, cause I'm a backpacker and you know, when, when you finally, you've used some of the newer materials, you're like, wow, cotton sucks. Right. And so you just, you know, like the new stuff breathes so much better and all that. Right. And then I found uh, merino wool. 
And, and you know what? Merino wool is just wonderful. And, and, it, and it wicks the moisture. It's really good at a lot of things. It's a natural fiber. And so I don't really miss the like polyester, the weird, the weird funky chem lab uh, materials as much because the merino wool really does it. And so for me, it's like, okay, I'm going to buy this versus that. Right, uh, right. And that's on the consumption well, side. Yeah, and I, I am actually a big proponent of consumers thinking about what they eat. I think about this a lot with seafood, too, because, you know, there are these tools to help us think through what's sustainable seafood and what's not. And I think the same thing applies to these plastic products. And I truly, I, I don't have, like, a perfect answer for this question because yeah. it sort of seems like there's an impact no matter which way you go. But I do think it's it's really important to think about these things. And um you know, and, and um, I try to make personally a lot of choices that veer away from plastic because I am worried that that is just a material that doesn't break down. You know, no matter how mm -hmm. small it gets, it's still not breaking down. It's still causing issues. And so I do try to steer clear of it. But, you know, one of the other things um, that's true is that uh, plastic, when you think about, say, uses of plastic in medicine, deeply important. It was an yep. incredibly important, you know, discovery. So a lot of us that work on this issue try to make clear, okay, we're worried about single-use plastics, we're worried about microbeads, you know, um, we're worried about bag ba uh, plastic bags, and we're not trying to say that anything made out of plastic is a horrible um, product because right. it's really, really important and it's been revolutionary for us in a lot of important ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't care who you are. You've got plastic in your life in some capacity. Exactly. So, exactly. yeah, it's it's a baby bathwater question, uh, you know, exactly. all, all the way around. So let's talk about uh, acidification of the ocean. I know that's a big deal. Um, does the plastic right. lead to that? Is it more just rising temperatures? Like why, why are the oceans getting more acidic? I'm so glad you brought that up because this is kind of one of those... Um, less well-known topics, I think. Um, and it's also often gets confused with climate change. Um, so I guess what I would say is that there are two very distressing impacts on the oceans from a changing climate, from the increase of carbon dioxide in our air. One is global warming. And that's, you know, we all know about that. This is the, the planet actually warming. And what that means for the ocean is the temperature of the ocean is warming. It's warming at different rates in different places, and that can cause species to shift. Um, and it kind of causes all those other sorts of changes in the ocean. And then the other one is ocean acidification. And in this case, what's happening, it's actually pretty straightforward chemistry. As the CO2 increases in our atmosphere, about a third of that gets dissolved back into the ocean. And actually, it dissolves most quickly into the coldest water. So the poles are feeling this most quickly. And it literally is changing the chemistry of the ocean. It's becoming more acidic. The pH level has changed. And since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, our oceans are about 30% more acidic than they were wow. prior to the Industrial Revolution. Um, and we, we think that might double, I think, in about 100 years, that 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 it could again increase by another 30 percent and what that's doing as that um as the acidity level rises it makes it harder for certain creatures to exist so for example shellfish have a hard time building their shells in those more acidic waters and we've seen this in a very real way in the pacific northwest where uh, the oysters have not reproduced as well over the last five years, um, and it's because of this change in acidification. Hmm. We also see it in places like um, the Great Barrier Reef, where corals are having a harder time calcifying um, because um, the calcium carbonate is not as available to them in the water. So it's very distressing. That's really interesting. It's like, you know what, you can't hide it. You can't see it. You can't see the CO2, really, but at the end of the day, you're measuring it. And, you know, and politically, I mean, we've got people denying it, so that doesn't help. Right. Right. And right. so, but we're actually, I mean, this is hard science. We know that this is happening. The oceans are becoming more acidic and it, yes. it's, and it's across the board, uh, you know, all oceans all over the world kind of thing. Yes, more it is water. all oceans all around the world. It is happening at different rates at different parts of the world. Um, so like I said, the colder water is um, absorbing this, the, the um, car, CO2 more quickly, and so they're acidifying more rapidly at the poles. Um, it's a, a, a great concern along the Pacific coast of the U.S. because there's a large area of kind of cold water upwelling there, and the, we're already starting to see in California the impacts of acidification. Um, the tropics, it's actually happening more slowly, but because coral reefs are so very sensitive to warming mm. waters, the acidification is like another cut in the death of a thousand cuts, if you will. Um, so, so those are some of the concerns. And, and yeah, we definitely are seeing the impacts without a doubt.
Yeah. And so just on, on this uh, kind of political front, it's just it's very uh, difficult being in an era right now where we have so much hard science saying this is happening and you know we need to do something about it and then having this kind of political backlash of uh, these kind of climate deniers and what's happening with the EPA and all, all sorts of right. things that are very regressive and dark um, you know and, and obviously you know industry has a lot to do with this uh, so what what does one even do in that type of thing I mean we've got eco zones that that we're trying to protect you know we're trying to protect all sorts of things within the the, the uh, environment and now you know you know, the kind of administration isn't allowing for, for some of this to move forward as quickly as we need. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, I, I can tell you, you know, what NRDC is doing is trying to stand very strong on what we see as the central tenets of ocean protection. And so some of the areas we're really concerned about are um, secure. We are we in the state of California and nationally have made good progress in protecting some mar marine areas like underwater parks think national parks think grand canyon but these are areas like off the coast of the atlantic um, where we just had the first ever marine monument designated off the, off of the continental u.s and in in, in Hawaii, a few years ago, I think it was 2006, George W. Bush actually designated the first ever marine monument period in the U.S. around the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And these are critically important marine areas. And so, um, and, and that's crucial to the sort of overall network of, uh, or, or um, um, formula for protecting the health of the oceans. So we're very concerned about ensuring that those protections stay strong. Um, and so we are, you know, tracking what's going on in Congress and trying to make sure that there's no erosion of those protections. Mm. Um, and then it, we're also concerned um, about uh, keeping our sustainable fishing laws strong and keeping our um, and, and not opening new areas to offshore drilling, for example, um, because w one, it's d intensely damaging to marine habitats. And two, it's the wrong direction to go right now. We're, we're stressing, um, we're increasing under these stresses of climate change, and we want to be able to address that. And so more and more Americans want renewable energy, not oil. So those are all issues that we are tracking. And I think the most important thing that your listeners can do is actually speak out in support of those things, in support of marine protected areas, in support of sustainable fishing laws, in, in, against offshore drilling, um, and let your voices be heard really to your to your senators and representatives. This is making a huge impact um, on our decision makers there in Washington when they're hearing from people in town halls. You know, we care about the oceans, we care about the environment, we believe in climate change, and you know, we need to be a leader. The U.S. does. So that's that's something that I think people have kind of lost a little bit of faith in. Um, you know, because people have been kind of writing their congressmen here and there and all this. And, and they feel like, you know, the world is sliding faster than, than, than we're able to fix right. it. And so I feel like there's been this kind of overall pessimism kind of starting to, to boil, boil over. Uh, but you are, you know, you're at a council where you are doing this work. You're seeing how it actually like plays out in the congressional districts and how it plays out with the politicians. And what I'm hearing from you is, do not let up. These people do listen, and we need to hear more of it. I absolutely think that's true. I think people are listening, you know, and, it, and I think it depends. You know, there's variation, of course, across the U.S. where you live, you know, how people um, think about some of these issues. Um, but I think um, it doesn't matter where you live. It's still an important issue to bring forward. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think we, we've seen just in the early days of the Trump administration that uh, both Democratic and Republican um, representatives have have listened, you know, uh, to, to some extent, to varying extents, to the, their constituents um, saying what's important. You know, this is something we talk about a lot in California as well, because we feel like, um, you know, the coast and oceans in California are so incredibly important to Californians and the millions of people that visit our state every year. It's a $45 billion economy, you know, the tourist economy um, along the coast and oceans. And, and, you know, we feel very proud of being able to stand up and say we're going to be an example for how we can um, stand strong um, in, in this political environment and, and underscore the importance of, of protecting these habitats and, and um, these resources. Okay, so we write in, we definitely you know, do whatever we can to raise our voice. How right. else can we get involved in doing this? I mean, obviously like boycotting 
uh, companies that that do unsustainable fishing, maybe, or you know, moving away from petroleum dependency. Yeah. Like, how how else can I, as an individual person, you know, because people feel so small, right? How can, right. How, how can I make a difference and know that it's working? Right. Oh, that's such a great question, and it's certainly one we wrestle with all the time. I do think that consumer action can make a big difference on some of these issues, and we've already talked about some of them. Plastics, you know, is a huge area where where consumer interest and concern and action can make a difference. And we've already seen that with the, the bag bans, for example. And look how easy it is for all of us in California to bring our canvas bags to the grocery store now. You know, we're all trained. So so I think that's really important. I think you mentioned unsustainable fishing, and that's another one. There are some really great tools out there to help people educate themselves about what kind of fish is sustainable to eat. Uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, if you go to their website, they have a great uh, seafood guide that you can download. They update it regularly. I think they actually do regional ones now too. There's a sushi guide that will guide you, you know, green, yellow, red, best choice, caution, you know, d mm. don't eat this. And, and that's, you know, those are really important tools um, because our, we eat a lot of seafood in this country and a shocking percentage of it is actually caught in a way that's either illegal or unreported. And a lot of that's being actually, we import about 90% of our seafood and, and a lot of that's being imported. Um, but we can, um, you know, use our voices and our checkbooks to indicate what, you know, our commitment to sustainable fishing. How do we know? Like if I'm at like TGI Fridays or some, you know, dumb restaurant that, you know, doesn't, doesn't even, you know, live in this ecosystem and I order the fish because I'm trying to be healthier. How do I know right. it's a healthy fish? How do I even, you know, do I tell this, do I tell the, you know, call over the manager and say, hey, you know, I want to know what this is and I want you to let your boss know that I care? Right. You yeah, know, this is a really tricky issue, partly too, because a lot of fish is marketed under lots of different names. And so, you know, there are a lot of people I know, a lot of people I work with who will ask, oh, yeah, where was this caught? What is this fish? And, you know, half the time the waiter doesn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually really do rely on that Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood guide. And there's some other ones that are similar to that because there's constantly new information. Um, and then the other thing I do is I will educate myself about a few kinds of fish that I feel pretty good about eating. So, for example, salmon caught in Alaska, I feel pretty good about. Um, shrimp that comes from a different part of the world, I'm not so sure. You know, so so when I'm eating out, if I'm not at the grocery store where I can maybe tell, ask my fishmonger more about, you know, what, where, the, where these species have come from, I might stick to that sort of shorter list of things to order because it makes me more comfortable. Yeah. So. Yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, what what's the NRDC working on now in the ocean, um, and how can my listeners support this and just jump in? Like, give, give us a couple action items to just literally jump in. Um, we could put in some some links to some URLs, and I'm just gonna just get everyone to kind of just get involved immediately instead of just listening. Like, like you know, just do something, sign something, whatever. Oh, that's so fantastic. Well, I, I think if you go to nrdc.org and click over to our oceans program, there should be some great action items there. In sort of broad brush, you know, we're concerned about a, a lot of these big threats to the ocean. We're certainly concerned about changing climate. We're concerned about over, we want to see an end to overfishing. We want to defend against these destructive practices like oil drilling. Um, and we're also working very hard to promote protections for specific species and places. Um, and so, um, I, so on the federal level, what that means is we are, um, working very hard to defend our uh, federal, our national fishing, sustainable fishing law. It's got a long name. It's called the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Um, and there is a bad bill in Congress right now that seeks to undermine that act. This is a model law that other countries look at. It helped us turn around overfishing in this country by setting limits on how many fish you can catch and by setting targets to what they call rebuild stocks that were depleted. And it's been working extremely well for the last, since 1976, and it's under threat right now. So, you know, yes, mm. you can call your congressman and say, we want to see that Fishing Act, that Magnuson Stevens Act, stay strong. So that's one really great thing people can do. Um, there are other threats that we're just tracking right now. We're very concerned about any attempts to open up offshore drilling um, in areas that have been protected already. And, um, and it, it, partly because we want to see those habitats protected, but also because we really believe, you know, we need to be moving towards renewable energy. So that's something to track and watch, you know, if there are efforts to try to um, expand oil drilling. Um, that would be a great place to, to step up and, and speak out against that. Um, uh, and, uh, 
um, trying to think what I've missed here, marine protected areas. Um, I don't know if I have a specific action for folks on that, but I can say um, that, that this is one of the things that scientists are really looking at as a critical way to protect the ocean. So you think about it, um, about 4% of underwater habitats are protected right now uh, globally. We have about 15% of terrestrial habitats that are protected in national parks and that sort of thing. And so, and scientists are very eager to increase that amount of protection. And so I think one thing you can do pretty easily is just, I know this sounds silly, but it's important, learn about the ocean, share that enthusiasm with other people and, and look for opportunities, you know, in your community to support efforts to, to protect ocean habitats. I love that. And then what, one, one thing I'd add to that is go to the Monterey Bay uh, uh, website, and we'll put a link here. Find out what fish is safest and healthiest to eat and, and, and choose to consume and spend your money with the fisheries that are doing the right work and are doing sustainable fishing. I mean, you could, you could basically, you know, uh, choke out companies that are doing the wrong thing by stopping, uh, you know, purchases of their products. And I think that's a very powerful lever as well. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think that's a really easy action. And some, I, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have this in a little wallet size card. And I literally have it in my wallet and I pull it out mm. and take a look at it. And I, and they have an app too. Mm. So these are great ways to do it. And, and you know, I, like I said, I just pick a few that I know. So when I'm in a restaurant, I can say, yes, if it's this kind if it's, you know, this fish from this area, I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and I, and I think too, you know, if that's not just a way to support the oceans, but it's a way to support the fishermen that are doing it right because we yeah. do have strong fishing laws in California, in the U.S., in a lot of U.S. states, and you know, for those fishermen that comply with those laws, you know, it's it's unfair to think that um, other fish that were caught in ways that are much less sustainable are competing. They're they're cheaper, you know. So yeah. it's great to be able to support that sustainability. Yeah, and and if and if you if you say you value the ocean, then you have to value the work that you know the good guys are doing to support you know a healthy ocean. And so you got again every time you buy fish. Uh, it's up to you to help, you know, right. kind of either support that reality or just be part of the the problem. Yeah, and that's for sure. Yeah, and I was just going to say too, I would encourage your listeners to come to nrdc.org as well. Um, you know, these are all evolving issues, and um, you know, we continue to sort of stay at the forefront and really try to um, keep our members up to date on how things are going and and where we need your help. So we would be, you know, thrilled to to have people come to our website and see how they can get involved that way too. Yes, done. Please do so and continue to do so. Uh, Elizabeth, this has been uh, very educational for me. I, I'm always kind of looking at where the blind spots are in my own life and where I could be better. And so every single one of us has a responsibility. Uh, these oceans are, are filled with life and there's a big part of the ecosystem that we don't see that supports life. I mean, they're obviously sinking carbon for us a little too much right now, so maybe producing right. less might help them. Uh, but you know, these are issues that, that are very uh, pertinent to the future of our species and um, all life, so it's, it's a big deal. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. Um, keep up the good work. Any way we can support you, I'm in. And if you're listening right now, go directly to nrdc.org and uh, find an issue that matters to you and weigh in, get involved, start supporting the initiatives that make sense to you. Support them all if you can and think about what you're buying what kind of fish you're buying and make that a different choice. Make one choice every single day uh, for a better planet and then just build that habit and keep building on that and you'll start to see the world change very rapidly. We can do this, we can do this together. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Pedro, it was really a pleasure.